Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, a conflict transformation online summit exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm here with my colleague Eva Schoenfeld. Uh, we are two of the three hosts of this summit. And today we have with us Daniel Christian Wall. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you for having me. So we're really happy to have you and bring your voice to this space. You were originally trained as a biologist, all the degree in biology, in holistic science, in Schumacher College and natural design. So you bring a lot of uh, knowledge and wisdom from different science fields. You've been director at the Findhorn College for some years, involved in other um, spaces of, of social change work and thinking and in new ways and some old ways also. So you've, you've, you've actually, not more recently, you've been already since 2007 and seven quite involved in uh, guy education in the development of Design for Sustainability Online course. You wrote an amazing book that has been a reference for, for many, many people about designing more regenerative cultures. It has been most definitely a bedside book for me. So deep gratitude for your, for your work. And perhaps, uh, well, so our interview is, is taking place on the context of week two, mm -hmm. where we explore different, um, different ways of seeing and, and different worldviews that can help us uh, shift our ways to approach conflict and, and tensions. And so I wonder, like, what led you to start thinking and working about regenerative cultures and design for regenerative cultures and how you could see that in relation with the topic of the summit, with conflict and different ways of looking into conflict? Uh, thanks for that question. It's an interesting one. Um, I, yeah, as you said, I'm originally German, and um, I guess through my mum's love for poetry, I was very influenced from early age by the work of um, Goethe. And, and Goethe was a poet and a scientist who kind of very early on said that this division of disciplines, like the, the way that we were dividing science from the arts and from poetry, um, was actually quite dangerous. And he also saw very early on that in the kind of Newtonian sciences that were developing really rapidly at his time uh, with the scientific revolution, um, that there was a quantity-focused way of seeing that was sort of abstracting the world as if it was out there. He, he, he was one of the early people who realized the difference between the, 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 the narrative of separation and the narrative of interbeing. And even more so, it wasn't just in a sort of biological sense that everything is interdependent that he saw interbeing. He understood the interbeing of mind and matter and that that was also somewhat a false separation that the, the sciences were leading us into. And, and I didn't get that when I was very young, but um, Goethe instilled in me this, this love for understanding nature. And so I became a biologist and then got to a point when I realized how as, as doing research on um, elephant seals at Año Nuevo State Park in California. And I wasn't allowed to speak about all the emotions, all the, the um, full-bodied experience that I had after being with these animals for three months during their breeding season and observing much more than the data I was collecting for the statistical programs that I had to then enter at night in order to do some statistics the next morning in order to be able to say sci something scientifically about what I'd seen as a naturalist in a very different way with many more ideas that weren't captured by that statistics worldview. And um, that frustration plus the insight that I could spend my life studying a species of whales or dolphins um, and it would probably go extinct if I didn't deal with my own species made me do a U-turn away from natural science. And, and so in, in many ways for me, um, that was the first real conflict where I saw that there was a way of seeing that just didn't 
I thought I could be a biologist in order to be close to nature. And I felt becoming a biologist was actually pulling me away from nature, despite the fact that I was sitting there in the middle of it. Yeah? And um, and then I kind of took a detour into, into trying to set up an environmental education center and um, an eco-village in southern Spain in 1999-2000. And when I realized how complex that is and how, again, coming back to conflict, how after about a year of tr thinking that it's all about solar panels and it's about compost toilets and it's about straw bale buildings and um, and all the techie stuff um, and the and the, the permi in the garden stuff, um, I realized that wait a minute, the social permaculture or the the, the getting people to under agree on a common vision and work together and make decisions together was huge and I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I also realized that you do need some money and you do need to somehow work with things like a business plan when you try to do something like that. And I didn't know anything about that either. And that took me to Schumacher College by detour because I was sort of starting, I re realized I needed more training. And suddenly I found out about this science that was addressing all the things I didn't like about science in the first place. There were people doing a master's in holistic science. And that took me to Gaia theory, complexity theory, chaos theory. And at the very heart of understanding chaotic dynamics in complex dynamic systems is the understanding that they're fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable. And with that comes a completely different notion of why we do science. Brian Goodwin said this to me. Um, rather than doing science in order to predict and control and manipulate the world better because we have big data and all that kind of stuff, eh? we actually have to do science to understand it better, to dance with this complexity, but in full humility of never being able to know it completely, never being able to know it to the point of being able to sort of predict and control it. So the, sh the intention shifts to appropriate participation. And for me, that is, is also at the core of how we can resolve a lot of conflict because it's the understanding that rather than moving like the paradigm framing often does, moving from this to that, from this to that, don't you get it? You have to see the world this way, is to say, no, let's, let's value diverse point of views, but hold them lightly. And... Um, understand that they can all inform us, but they're always point of views, so they're always limited. And um, and not move into a world where we think that before we can build the more beautiful world our heart knows is possible, we all have to agree on everything. Uh, um, if, if it's all about not knowing and embracing uncertainty, then if we start there, then we can hold our opinions lightly enough to still find higher ground in our diversity to move forward together. And that, that's that been sort of my journey after Schumacher College, doing a PhD and then, then going to Findhorn and living this at Findhorn very strongly, where a place where, where wounded people, traumatized people from the world of overworking in London or in other big capitals who had maybe been very successful, even made a bit of money, um, burned out in this story of separation only in the head, only competing for money space, and then came into this communitarian space of moving back into the heart, which is so deeply important. But the framing was the biggest, like the Sufi quote, the biggest journey we can make is the journey from the head to the heart. True, absolutely right. But if you do it in a way that you then deny the head and and say, oh, I've been there, done that, was terrible, um, now I'm a heart person, yeah? um, then you forget, forget the gifts of, of the head. And, and for me, my, my big journey is trying to build the bridges, to do the synthesis, avoid the pendulum swing. Because if you go from ego to eco, and you imagine it as a journey, as a pilgrim, you get to eco, and then you realize, wait a minute, we've forgotten some more important things here about healthy ego healthy being in self as relationship to other and world in service to a larger whole so I can nourish myself. Like the nutshell of saying it's enlightened self-interest to care for community and care for the whole. Yeah? And then you come back and, and you want to find out what did I forget? What baby with the bathwater did I th throw out here? And you meet people who are on the journey still out to eco. And all they can tell you is you don't get it, mate. 
it's it, we need we need to get away from ego and we're, we're going to eco what, what are you they think you've just come up behind them rather than you're on the backward journey yeah and for me this is an image that is at the heart of what your course is about yeah, yeah, yeah so go go eva please the, the, the word that was coming to is integration mm. um um and i wondered where you know where you were seeing that when you when you're talking about sort of uh, building and developing regenerative cultures. What what kind of processes you're seeing that are useful in helping people to uh, really embody that that principle? Mm. Um, well, I guess I mean again, I wrote a book on regenerative cultures, but I don't. I'm not the expert on regenerative cultures. I even mm. I wrote a book that has a paradox in the title, and uh, it says designing regenerative cultures. I don't believe you can design regenerative cultures. Um, but I think that design is very powerful because it's the signal of human intention. And I think that if we coordinate our shared intentions for creating a better world, we can have that agency in the world and, and create it. But um, cultures emerge out of the relationships and the conversations and the interactions of everybody who's part of it. We all constantly, every day, every moment, everything is an intervention. Everything changes. Our thoughts, our actions, um, our words, particularly. Um, and so, for me, in when I when I sat down to write my book, I I, I asked myself the question: But what can I write about that makes any sense in ten years, fifteen, twenty years' time? Um, what solutions can I suggest? Like having spent twenty years with the Permis, the Eco Village people, the the Transition Town people, um, in working in consultancy for government and teaching with guy education and all these different like I've I've heard about a lot of solutions in those twenty years of of apprenticeship and pilgrimage and searching, but I suddenly thought, oh, to write another book that is saying you don't get it, come here, I'll give you the solutions, follow me, I'm the great saver of the world um wasn't really what i wanted to do and and the the big twist for me came when when i um there's two two quotes that are in the beginning of the book one of them is einstein's supposed einstein's quote he doesn't possibly has never said it um that if i had a problem that my life depended upon uh, depended upon and i had only one hour to solve it i would spend 55 minutes of trying to get the right question because then I could solve it in five minutes. Um, still a little bit in the problem solving mindset and all that, but it, it, but it, it speaks very strongly to the importance of the right question and how, how we can waste our time if we try to answer the wrong question. A bit like Joseph Campbell's wonderful quote, when you get to, the, there's nothing worse in the world that you get to the top of the ladder and suddenly you realize it, it's leaning against the wrong wall. I think that just sums up most of, capitalist neoliberal economy and personal experience of the people who were stuck in that that journey um but um uh, oops kind of detour and lost my thread here um no but uh, maybe maybe i can help you there yeah. one of the things that is coming for me is this this very strong message that we need to consider that the ways we've been responding to the crisis are part of the crisis it's one of the things I hear you. So this narrative of ongoing othering, other, either in excluding, is keeping us stuck. And yeah. particularly the, the spaces of change, right? Because we keep, I mean, it's clear that there's multiple solutions at our disposal. A lot of people are saying that we just don't, why we can't be in a, in a different place than we are because the solutions are here. So there's something else, some other aspects that are missing and I, I'm, I'm really curious, it would be great you could share some of the insights while writing the book and trying to address some of these core questions. What came up for you? Yeah. Of in, in your, that yeah. Th thanks for that, because it, it also helped me remember where I was going earlier, um, which was the, um, the insight suddenly that there's the other, the other quote that I wanted to mention, which is um, at the very beginning of the first chapter, um, it's Rainer Maria Rilke's advice to a young poet in which he says, you have to live the questions more deeply. You have to live into the questions because the answers might be in a language that you're not ready to understand yet. 
only when you live the questions more fully and live into them, then maybe one fine day you will live into the answer without even noticing it. And um, for me, that, together with that Einstein quote, gave me what Joanna Macy called an epistemological trick. Um, I, love, I love her um, review of the book that made it worth writing because she really particularly picked up on that and loved it um, because by not pretending that I have the answers, which I don't, um, but by going through the landscape that I had explored for 20 years of people looking for answers. So wonderful people, people like my mentors, David Orr, John Todd, Janine Benyus, um, Donella Meadows, um, Amory Lovins, uh, Gunther Pauli, Paul Hawken, Satish Kumar, Fretjof Kapra, all these wonderful mentors that, that I met and have had the opportunity to work with most of them. Um, and then I looked at the essence of what they were talking about and I just did a little magic with their core idea and turned it into a question. And what I noticed as I was doing that is that the minute, if I tell you the 10 principles of being whatever, regenerative, thriving, flourishing, pick, pick the word you, you prefer, um, then I still want you to sign up to these 10 principles and make them your logo. Uh, your your rallying call and and they they hold a lot of wisdom most of them do but the minute you turn them into questions you're still carrying the same message you're still giving that key insight of ah that's a way to think about this that might me help me reach wisdom and insight but you're putting it into a way of saying how does that fit for you I'm, I'm actually asking you to respond when I put it into a question rather than tell you. And, and so I played around with this throughout the entire book of, of just sort of, for example, Janine Benyus worked with wonderful people over a long period of time to integrate the knowledge that before that um, people like John Todd developed in the, the percepts for biological de design thinking turned into life principles. Uh -huh. When you turn life's principles into life's questions, woof, magic happens. Similarly, the wonderful um, eight, he first called them principles, he now calls them qualities, which I like a lot better, um, John Fullerton and regenerative economics. If you turn those into questions, woof, something magic happens. And the reason why I go on about this to with respond to your question, Uno, is that I think if we live the questions together, which I think is at the heart of working and creating, letting regenerative cultures emerge in place, out of culture and out of the wisdom of place, is the process of living the questions together. But the, the prerequisite for that is the shift away from the hero leader model. I have the idea, come follow me, let's go. I, I'm regenerating the earth and rallying people around me who will regenerate the earth with me. Uh -huh is a wonderful, heroic intention, beautiful, but it is, it is framed in a mindset of look at me and follow me. The minute you invite people to live the questions in place together, you say, I can only offer a set of questions. You need to see if they're meaningful to you in your place, with your cultural background, with your story, with your trauma, with your hope for the future and your children's hope for the future. But if the questions are powerful and they connect you to each other and they connect you to place and they connect you to the seasons and the long time spans, then I think the questions themselves do the regenerative work through the people in place. And, and, and it also puts us into a mindset of being humble apprentices and pilgrims on a path where we never reach the end. There is no destination regenerative culture. There is no destination sustainability. The, the, at the heart of regeneration is the action of regenerating, letting go of patterns that no longer serve and bringing into being patterns that are now called for. And, and so for me, that in, in the heart of that conversation is the not conflict resolution, but the conflict dissolution into accepting conflict and diversity of points of view as part of the process of living the questions together. 
and 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 so I suddenly can talk to a guy that I'm not really fully agreeing with. We're both trying to save the world, but he's trying to get the U European New Green Deal cemented in Brussels, and I kind of prefer to do other stuff here locally, doing regenerative development with people on Mallorca because I feel I need to get my hands in the ground and work with the people in front of me. Um, but actually, that guy, I mean, I've Tom Carmack comes to mind, the guy who wrote with Christiana Figueres this, this, this wonderful book, The Future We Choose. I'm sure that there's a whole bunch of the wrong kind of green people who think that that's all hogwash. But I know that Tom Carmack is a beautiful human being who's been a monk in Thailand, who used to, when I met him 20 years ago at Schumacher College, help at Schumacher College for three weeks and then go off and do another Vipassana retreat. That guy's sat on his cushion. That guy's done his inner work. That guy cares about the human planet deeply. Yeah? He's come out of the navel-gazing, safu-sitting phase into the active work of helping Christiana Figueres get at least Paris as an agreement on the road. And now through other processes, um, the, the countdown project and so on, trying to constantly twig and transform the COP process so it actually does what it set out to do. Um, and I don't want to other those people. I don't want to disagree with them. I don't want to say that, oh, they don't get it. They're just not with it. It's all about extinction is near. And 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 um, and if, if you don't um, agree that we're all everything is collapsing, then, then you're in denial. Th these are othering strategies that ultimately could come from an ego who's trying to get attention to his version of the story. Uh -huh. Can we let go of that shit and agree that we're all just in inquiry together? Oops, sorry, I kind of got, went, went into a bit of a rant there. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's great, Daniel. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, fascinating uh, and really useful take on you know how to how to uh, deal with those continual kind of coming up against one another and and as you were saying often with people who are actually we're quite close to mm. um as well as with people you know and you were talking earlier about you know and sometimes there is the need to say no that's not that's yeah. not okay yeah um, well, thank, thank you for bringing that up. I, I just felt strongly that I needed to add that on because, of mm -hmm. course, the minute you make that voice that I just offered, yeah, um, you, you, you're open to somebody saying, what about the KKK um, xenophobic yeah. asshole next door or um, the IFD in Germany doing what they're doing? Yeah? And, of course, um, the, and, and this, is, this is, I think, where the, the conversation needs to be more nuanced. That there's a middle band where we keep disagreeing and dissipating energy that could actually be aligned to co-creating a better future. Mm -hmm. And then there's clear demarcations on either side of the spectrum where we have to call out the psychopaths and the sociopaths and the, and the um, truly degenerative kind of mind polluting stories. Uh -huh. and, and, and it's a fine line because then it's, it's on the edge of the othering them. And, and again, how can we hold people that are in these extremes still, and this is where the bodhisattva work comes in, is to just sort of still hold them in the space of saying, from all that has happened to you in your life, with all the traumas that you've been subjected to as a human being, in the context that you grow up and everything you lived and the stories they fed into your mind, I can't completely and utterly forever judge you to be this misguided and and to be pronouncing these things, I still have to see the human being, the hurt human being in there, and at least somehow leave the door open. I don't know. And and I know that it's it's that's where it gets tricky. Um, I, I would would love your opinion on that, uh, both of yours. Where how how do we find that nuance of of like in I think that. Yeah, I'll briefly tell the story because it's a beautiful story. On, on September 11th, 2001, I was in the Masters in Holistic Science and I spent the day walking over Dartmoor with Stefan Harding 
um, where he tell, told in his wonderful embodied um, sort of blend between deep ecology, Gaia theory and Jungian psychology, he told the story of the Gaian dance of how um, the rain falls on the rock and r rain weathers car uh, carbonate out of the rock that then feeds the um, algae in the ocean that then um, breathe out a gas called dimethyl sulfate and um, that creates the clouds and the clouds then rain and all these wonderful large cycles and the dance of Gaia basically. And we were all buzzed with it, the group of nine students coming back from Dartmoor and everybody looked like they had kind of just been run over by a truck. They were white in the face with like sweat pearls on their, on their upper lips and and like, what the heck is going on? And then just like go to the living room, have a look at the TV. And then there was an auto repeat the images of the World Trade Center being hit. Huh? And um, we even had an American student who had been a Navy SEAL and then a boat captain on a whale watching boat in Hawaii and then a holistic science student. So he had this whole kind of lineage into the that whole story. And the reason why I came to this is that the how do you start on September 12th, a holistic science group after that kind of thing happened? And we had a tutor at the time called Jordi Pichem, a, a, Pichem, a Catalan philosopher who is, is, is a really wonderful and deep thinker. And he was really supportive of us back then. And um, he opened our little space by reading two poems. And I would encourage you to put those poems on the website for your for your project. They're both by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and one of them was um, Call Me By My True Names. And the other one was the, the, the piece on interbeing. And um, Call Me By My True Names is, I can't read it without crying. Um, because it speaks to that we're both side of the spectrum. It says like there, there are lines like this, I am the young girl who throws in the, uh, who throws herself into the water because she's been raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate. And, and, and then he you know, talks about the arms dealer and the, the starving girl, uh, a kid in, in Uganda. And, and he basically really speaks to that we have the perpetrator and the perpetrated in us and that we somehow need to heal the rift um, otherwise when we're not going to do the healing and but 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 that's the that's the long-term work that's the work that we're there over centuries possibly to do but my my sense is that to kind of bring it back home is in the middle band where we actually agree on so much, where we care for the future for, of our planet, the future of life, um, where, where we care for our children's future. Um, we need to learn how to disagree more intelligently and still find the higher ground of working together on basic things like Aldo Leopold's land ethic. A thing is right as long as it supports the vitality and um, yeah, the vi vitality of life's community, it is wrong if it does otherwise. Um, something like that. Uh, is, is Aldo Leopold, 1969 in Assam uh, County Almanac, proposing a land ethic. And that's a basis. If we, if we can work for life as life together in our diversity, then, then I think we have a chance. And that for me is what regenerative cultures is about. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. One of the things that is coming up for me really strongly is this is this sense that well, one thing you said is um, that development and uh, evolution is not, or that I, I understood in between the lines that development and evolution is not a linear thing. So it's not something a process you can control. Life as a process is emergent. And so um, dissonant voices and different perspectives might actually uh, bring new insights and, and open up new possibilities. Mm -hmm. And by excluding voices in us 
and, and around us by othering aspects of our own psyche and our own human experience and othering others, we keep stuck in a dynamic that doesn't allow that particular system to evolve because it's stuck in its own in a in a moment of its development path. And for me, for instance, observing the dynamics of polarization around the race and uh, in the states is really a, a, an observation of how much those voices were shut up for a long period of time because of the way the left and and the mainstream uh, dialogues were were kind of restrictive to that sort of of, of extreme voices that it actually grow to the stage it is today. Mm. So it's just like when you have on an inner voice uh, of something we want to shut up and then it kind of gets so much strength that yeah. it almost possesses us. I mean, so that, I'm all- that, that reminds me of Anna Mendel's work in process-oriented psychologists and stuff, where, where, where basically when this voice comes up, it comes out of the field because it's been repressed for so long. It's actually not the person. Like Also, that's a great tool of de- escalating conflict is when that voice comes up to to recognize that it's not that person and you don't need to attack that person that person has the courage and systemically the role to voice that perspective and 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 for me this is the paradox embracing that i i feel like at the same time as we need to embrace not knowing we also need to move forward um because everything is an intervention and no action is also action uh-huh. And and it's the, these paradoxes of there's urgency, so we need to slow down. There's a global problem, so there's only one solution, which is to do, solve it locally and bioregionally, but in global solidarity. It it isn't solved globally. You cannot. Bill Reed said this to me in a conversation I had with him recently. He said, "Daniel, it's impossible to save the planet. You can only save places, but you can save places all over the place." And suddenly we've contributed to saving humanity, not the planet, of course, because the planet will be fine without us. Um, sorry, I got interrupted you. But is, is, that's also bringing this notion for, for me of fractality but, and also of nestedness that you know that what, one of the things for me more is most insightful when you start thinking about regenerative development and some of the ideas you've been bringing and, and some of the people of regenesis and other spaces is this notion that we need to move towards working in, in different levels or different lines of work. One is obviously, and often because we live in such an individualized society, the focus is just on the individual. But we need to be aware that Our inner work is relevant because the inner conditions affect the way we show up, but then the way we show up and interact with others to allow them also to continue their journey of unfolding as human beings and then the larger being of social like communities, organizations, we need to work on these multiple levels of contributing for more ability within those systems to uh, address difficulties, conflicts, and tensions as places of potential for a shift, knowing that we don't control evolution. Evolution is, you know, uh, an emergent, is, is a, a process that has a lot of emergent uh, novelties that we cannot control. We can maybe nurture the, the right conditions. And so maybe we, we're getting moving towards the end of the interview so maybe there's there's something you let, want to talk let me, about let me go to one thing there because uh, i think that's quite interesting which is just nuancing out the fractality bit that the fractality isn't just spatial in the sense that it's like i i've done a lot of work in my phd on design for human and planetary health in 2006 with this notion of scale linking design that I, I took from, from Stuart Cohen, who now is, is, is doing the Regenerative Communities Network, um, of how, because it's fractal and one complex dynamic system where all boundaries are just mind-made boundaries to some extent, um, but uh, they're point, point, points of connection and, and exchange just as much as points of separation, but they're also necessary. Um, the, this, the one thing that is also important is to understand that in this kind of panarchy loop where we get comfortable with with breakdown of old structures and dissolution and collapse 
and see it not as final collapse, but as collapse, as the release of structures that no longer serve, that enable the reformation of new patterns that is part of the evolutionary journey. That this was what's called the adaptive cycle in resilience theory eh, is also nested because that gives us an image of the, not just the, the spatial nesting of local, regional, national, global, but um, it gives us the temporal dimension of how the large Gaian cycles that are, or the geological cycles of 10,000s of years affect reality for us constantly, but they're slower cycles. And we human beings have very little in, play in, in these cycles, but they inform the larger system. Similarly, the health of an ecosystem is much more of a larger cycle than the breakdown of a couple of trees falling in a clearing in the Amazon rainforest and the little cycle starting anew. Like there's a little collapse locally that feeds from the larger system and there, therefore has resilience. The lesson in there is that we need to build structures that mimic that resilient scale linking and also if we understand the world in this nested temporal and spatial way, we can dissolve some of our conflicts with the three horizons, with, with, a, with, a, with a map that somehow puts it on a timeline where we understand that giving birth, like the Joanna Macy's beautiful image of, of hospice workers of a dying world and midwives of a new world, that this is a journey that is a cathedral builder's journey, that we all are on over long periods of time as part of our tribe that will go on into the future when we are long gone. And, and so certain patterns of what we're trying to birth, like I'm having some conversations with the really esoteric side of, of Regenesis and, and, and the International Futures Forum wisdom keepers on Bennett's qual systems and uh, systematics. And Bennett was t thinking in 10,000 year timescales. Uh -huh. um, of course, Extinction Rebellion would say, hey, we've got a problem right here. Let's deal with that first. Yeah? But, but, but I think it serves us to think of the journey in those timescales and at least in the timescales of hundreds of years and see ourselves on that journey because then we, we can also relax about not trying to have to solve everything right now and, and differentiate what larger transformations of society we are part of but we might never see complete. Like, like Robert Gilman has these three big eras where he says there was the big tribal era 5,000 years and then there was the era of empires 5,000 years and then the planetary era. And, and what I like about this graphic is that it makes the beginning of our planetary era in the Renaissance. So suddenly the whole of scientific development and technology becomes the, the end of the era of empires and the beginning of the planetary era. And it's, it's like that. We're connected non-virtually, uh, non-locally through a few bits and bobs zooming around cyberspace here. Uh, um, that means that we can relax into that diversity of perspectives also in saying, you're right, we need to transform the economic system and we need to do so urgently. And we need to create new systems of governance. We need to do so urgently. But to value those larger systemic transformation doesn't mean that somebody doing local permaculture or building a local community owned wind farm or stuff is just some idiot doing techie solutions when we actually have to do the systemic stuff. We have to do both and we have to value it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you keep getting me on hobby ones. And Don't lucky us because we're we're different and we all feed into that. You know, I, I love the the, the 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 image of the ecosystem and and, and that's a, a a good way of looking at the kind of diversity that can feel so uncomfortable. But but if you just see that, that there's so many jobs that need doing and they all need done at different levels. Um, and you know, there are people who want to do all of those jobs. Yeah, and it, it's entry points, like on a, on a completely other level. I was just talking with somebody else yesterday about this. And um, for some of it, some people, they're just in their story, with their background, boom, theory you opens up and they kind of join the Otto Sharma tribe and go on deep journeys with that. And it's great. Somebody else is going, oh, I love 
John Croft and Dragon Dreaming just kind of gets me going beyond anything else. And they go on to that journey. Yeah? And, and then the next person feels very strongly that Charles Eisenstein is speaking to their soul. And the next person loves a little bit of here's a hero, follow him. And, and Joe Brewer is just the genius to say, wow, this guy is synthesizing so much interesting stuff. I, I'm happy to follow him. Yeah? Um, they're entry points. And, and people will get to the point of saying, okay, I've learned my bit and now I hear about this. And, and, and if we hold that diversity even, like the personal styles might, because of our own traumas, like I, I love Joe and I get triggered like crazy by, I know he's not kind of in it for some sort of super ego trip. He's a really sound human being, but I read the messaging and it lands in me like, like here's, here's some narcissism. And, and, and I'm even daring to speak that publicly because I love him and I deeply appreciate his work. And I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing him in that. I'm voicing openly, cathartically, my own reactions where I kind of go, Joe, work, uh, uh, and at the same time, I want to give you a hug and thank you for what you're doing. Uh -huh. So there are so many things that, that came for me, Daniel. Thank you so much. W one of the things that I think maybe I want to just voice out is perhaps a need that we start to work collectively on, on our own ability to look at living the, the systems in trajectory, in movement, and not in like fixed, rigid ways. So because I, I want to say that also because we see that ruling out in terms of the notions of identity of people, that this is who I am. And it, it, it's there often in spaces people are caught in those dynamics of looking at themselves in a very rigid way and looking at others in a very rigid way, which keep us in, in our collective system stuck because we cannot, of course, move but if we have that understanding of deep observation of living process of, of, of the development process of living beings we start to see that everything is in movement and, and then we can see different scales you mentioned not only geographic but time wise and start to have this really perspective that life on the planet has been evolving we are part of that story we might connect with our role in it or or get get waste in history and some other things will continue to come but obviously we are being kind of called many of us feel today we've been called to in different roles bring about that this turning for a new possibility for human beings to occupy their rightful place within the larger scale of life which means we are not centered anymore and uh, and Let me, like, leaving the question. So these yeah. are kind of some of the things that really that were really left for me really strongly. The, uh, you just triggered another th thought that, that is probably worth briefly talking about, which is I've noticed that part of the process of othering is that we hear certain trigger words. And the minute that trigger word comes up, we, we assume we know where the other person is at and how they're framing the world. And what I've realized is that sometimes there's a space where then conflict or misunderstanding or an inability to, to see eye to eye and collaborate happens partially because we're not holding the possibility that other people hold that word in a different way. So this ha happened to me in a conversation with, with friends at, at Regenesis Group, where we're talking about health and planetary health and, and systems resilience and, and creating a healthier system and all that can easily be heard as working at the maintain level, not the regenerative level. But if you have a dynamic temporal, like I just tried to explain, process view of health, of not being something static to go back to a state that we need to recover, but as that thing that constantly gets disrupted, which is Aaron Antonovsky's salutogenic approach to health, how do we maintain positive health, knowing that we're constantly going to be bombarded with reasons that will push us off kilter, but we have to keep evolving. And, and so for me, it's really important to keep also, as we, we use all this wisdom that different lineages bring, keep a little bit more um, agility around framing to understand that 
A, we use words differently. And this is, brings me to one final thing that I want to say is that another big divide that we create is the divide where people, and I I get hurt by this, again, holding up just my personal story here. I get really hurt when people call me an academic or a theoretician yeah? or, um, or whatever, public intellectual. Yeah? On, on one level, wonderful compliments. I know beautiful people in all those boxes. I don't like being poked in boxes ever. That's again my personal story. But but what I see there is is a is a false dualism between theory and practice that doesn't pay enough attention that every good bit of practice is informed by a worldview and by ideas and by core beliefs and by ideas about what's important and what's not important by, by, by prioritizing A over B. And so we all constantly live our theories in our practice. And by changing theory, all you do is you're changing an upstream pattern that is actually really that, that, that is autopoetic in itself in our mind space, in the noosphere. So just one example, just because now everybody talks about the Anthropocene and we love resilience, Stockholm Resilience Center, and yeah. some people, other people think he's part of those, um, but uh, with that Christopher Rockstrom and so on, yeah, um, everybody jumps on the Anthropocene idea, but the Anthropocene is a continuation of man over nature, we are the big force, we are doing everything, changing everything. Like the, the shorter we can keep the Anthropocene and the quicker we can give birth to the Ecocene or the Ecozoic, as, as Thomas Berry said, we, we're actually doing the going from ego to eco to seva to being of service in humility as part of the larger story. And we stop telling the story that, oh yeah, that was the age where human beings changed everything. Eh? Um, so, but, but these framings are super important. I think that's where we need to, like, again, I know that we're, our entire conversation has been skirting the edge of paradox, but that's maybe why it was worth having. Because, it's always easy to say, yeah, but he's right, but he's not looking at that. And that's true, yeah, because that's just how it is. Yeah, we had to make choices, but I, I must confess I, I, loved, I loved it. One thing I want to share is it perhaps is an invitation for a, a future conversation. Who knows, David, but Daniel, but it's like... Um, you mentioned you mentioned the work of Joseph Campbell, and there and and the hero's journey is a big part of it. And and one of the things I often see in, in spaces of change, and and I myself went through that. And I think in a way, all of us in certain moments of our lives, this idea that we need to keep doing things, we otherwise the world is not going to get better. So there's this sense of the the savior of the world. We're going to save the world, make the world a better place. And so I think the hero's journey is this kind of mythology. It's a bit associated for me with patriarchal way of thinking that you're going to get something out of your journey, a new gift, a new power. And one of the things that's emerging a lot and somehow relates with many of the things we talked this con in during this conversation is more uh, myth mythological uh, stories around uh, related with women, where it's more much more about dissolving and somehow falling apart and really uh, losing ourselves to find our way and, and not, not like having a journey that you end up with the, with the right answers again. And, you know, so I really want to just celebrate your, the, the main message of stick with questions, keep inquiring, be open to uh, know more about where we are at as as individuals as collectives and acknowledging that it's not all about individual and not all about collective it's in the dance between that we find we find our way so it's it's the paradox of our times to me is that we are when you truly understand participation like the story of interbeing, that it's all one whole transforming, that we are world and we are self. And we need to, we live for, for individual and we live for the whole. And in that is this opposite actually has the potential that, that creates life's journey into novelty. And so I, I think we're called into humility 
of saying, who am I to know? And my knowledge will always be limited. And at the same time, audacity of saying, we can all change the world. And the truth is we all do every day by repatterning the future in the present, by how we respond to what rises in us when an other comes up and we can choose between othering or trying to understand or simply holding our experience. And, and yeah, that I think what you just said, that, that it's, that is a being state change, not a doing change. And, and I think that somehow for me more and more, that's where um, I put my hope that more and more people work yeah. on their being state change. And, and find our vocation and uh, and our role in it, right? You said there's different roles to to be taken, and so we need each one of us to find our own vocation and role to to bring forth. Daniel, it has right. been a pleasure. I think I can share. I, I can imagine everybody feeling the same that we could be here for another hour or so talking. So to be continued. Yeah. Thank you so much for your precious time and uh, and your voice and wisdom. Uh, thank you for everybody for listening. There's going to be more more um, something more to follow up a bit on Daniel's uh, work after the interview. So keep keep uh, in the journey. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.